don't know me uh, i'm currently working with amex now uh, for i just joined few months back so it's around 6 months i joined during when the lockdown started and prior to this i was working with the uh, bosch uh, and i mainly work uh, with java spring um some bits and pieces with python angular and stuff uh, yeah so so told me that uh, just present something anything out of the wild and uh, um, i thought of maybe we could present this uh, so it's um, microservices so um, it's it's not a technology or something it's it's just an architectural style or, or an architectural style of software development on cloud so uh, how many of you here have heard of this uh, word called microservices Yes, I heard about that. Okay, so um, can you tell me, like, uh, what do you understand by it? A microservice means uh, some small service. I do not have any <laughs> that much idea, but I know uh, it's like uh, some small uh, services uh, that are done in microservices. Okay, so like, uh, how many of you have uh, maybe have developed web applications or something like that? Uh, like you have deployed something on a server and then you browse it from a browser, or you have created an Android app or something and you have some server in behind where you access some APIs, uh, call some stuff, and show something. How many of you have done something like that? Yes, I have done that. Okay, so uh, basically, just like you were telling there, but Jyoti, I guess you were telling, right? So, uh, microservices is kind of like a small service, like what you told. So, you have a web application, something like that, a multi-tier application where basically the logic is running somewhere else, and uh, you are accessing it from some client. And uh, when you are having this kind of an application. and uh, the app, the size of the application grows and when the size of the application grows it becomes uh, difficult like if it is an enterprise level application um, let's take for example google or amazon or anything so if they have an single application it becomes very difficult to manage to uh, bring out new releases to uh, do things because uh, uh, if you have an one application is a single point of failure then uh, and it becomes a very giant piece of code it becomes very difficult to maintain so microservices is a kind of an architecture where you basically uh, break then an entire uh, enterprise application and you decompose it into smaller applications and which are uh, loosely coupled as in they can work individually and uh, also they work together when needed that's that's how it is so uh, microservices here it's nothing kind of an technology or something it's just an architectural style of uh, client server uh, software development okay so uh, here uh, in, in this talk today i won't be talking actually much about microservices because it's a very big thing i'll talk a little about microservices and then uh, things around it like uh, how you do testing how the infrastructures are there and uh, how ci cd is done and all this so moving forward so just like i was telling that uh, microservices is an architectural style where a single enterprise application is decomposed into smaller groups of services that is bounded by a domain so uh, so there has to be a domain based on this domain this uh, enter uh, enterprise application will be decomposed into smaller smaller services and this microservices each service should be loosely coupled so that uh, they can work individually it should not be that uh, for a microservice to run it will need another service so it should be loosely coupled that's how it is and each microservice should be testable and maintainable and then it should be individually deployable it should not be that uh, okay if i have to deploy one service then i need to also deploy another service as independent it should not be like that okay uh, for example let's uh, take something like uh, if you, if there is a cricket match going or something
Okay, and uh, today uh, there's a match going left, like I told. And today there will be a lot of demand for uh, maybe checking the scores or something. Okay, so uh, you can treat that as a particular thing, and uh, you need not affect the other parts of the application. Maybe for things like quick info, they show other stuff as well uh, apart from scores. So uh, if they need to do something specific for that, they can individually deploy the scores application, just the scores application. They need not uh, do it uh, for everything, that's what it is. It's, it should be individually uh, deployable. Uh, and in, in the sixth point, what you say, it should be scalable. I, I don't know if you guys know what is scaling and stuff. I'll come to that part later. So it, it, scaling is like if uh, there's, a, uh, there's too much of demand today on getting the scores, you can just scale that part up so that uh, you don't need to scale the entire application, but uh, you, you can just scale a particular part so that uh, you can uh, respond to more requests and stuff. Okay. And each of the microservices should be the, can be developed independently. So it, it can even be that different teams are devel developing one small, small microservices. Okay, maybe it's not uh, sounding all connected at this point. Maybe in the latter point of uh, the talk, maybe this will make sense. Maybe I'll come back that time. Okay. So, any questions up to this point? Or I can move okay. forward. Yes, yes, I have a question. Like, um, can we say uh, uh, Docker or Kubernetes uh, microservices? Okay, so. Uh, I'll come to that point, but uh, like uh, Docker, Kubernetes, these are technologies. So, and microservices is an architectural style. Okay, you, you need not use uh, Docker or Kubernetes in a microservice, it's not required. Uh, microservice is an architectural style where basically you decompose a very big application into smaller chunks, into logical entities that is bounded by a domain. Okay, now how you do it? That is up to your implementation point. Okay, Ritik, I have a question. Ritik, yeah, I yeah. have a question. Thank yeah, you. Please. Yeah, you you say the microservices is a basically architecture, but we know basically for the last ten years, model view controller. That model is generally a, uh, entity relationship, a, a, a enterprise Java beans or DBMS, and uh, controller is generally a servlet. And view is generally by controlled by JavaScript and all. So, uh, how you can uh, how you can relate your microservices to this model view controller approach? Am I am I okay? Is it understandable to you? What I, I say? Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. you. Carry okay. on. You carry on. At your time, so, you answer. You at your yeah, time. No, I, I'll just answer it uh, right away. Okay. So, uh, what you just told about the MVC architecture, that's uh, on a more micro level. And uh, that is like how you design your one microservice. So uh, you will have one layer for the controller. Then you will have some uh, service layer where you write your business logic. Then you will have some data access layer where you do all the abstractions of how you connect to the database. Uh, how do you store? Like maybe it could be in a database or maybe in an S3 bucket store or maybe in the file system, whatever be it. So that's in the application. This is not talking about uh, inside of an application, this is talking about like whether you go with a monolith, monolith as in the there's only one application, then one entire big application. Okay, and microservices just break all one monolith into smaller chunks. That's what microservice talks about. So, model view controller, it's more at a micro level where you are designing one service, and in there, how you arrange your code, where do you put your uh, URL mappings, where do you put your business logic, where do you uh, do your database operations. That's what the MVC architecture talks about. Okay. The question is Yeah, great. It's, it's, uh, thankful. Because actually, uh, whenever, uh, whenever in, in our student days or in our working life, at that time is a basic monolith computer is IBM mainframe. Then it comes the 1983-84 uh, the PC come, then the, after PC come, the, the client server is very popular. Then the Visual Basic and Power Builder is very uh, good tool for client server-based application. They are basically client and server is typically the SQL server 
and uh, Microsoft is making a heavy business out of it because they make Visual Basic and uh, uh, SQL Server as a backend. That is a client server. Then comes uh, uh, just little bit of history. Then Model View Controller. Then Model View Controller uh, uh, Type Two. And and now I am just asking uh, whether it is anyway uh, uh, linking with multi-threading uh, of uh, language. But it is a totally uh, totally distant question, you can answer it later or not. Is, is it related with our Python, how it is related with our Python language or Java language, multi-threading support with the microservices. Okay, thank you. You carry on at your own pace, you can yeah. answer this. Okay, so uh, uh, talking about, again when you are uh, talking about Python, when you are talking about Java, when you are talking about Node, you are again going to the implementation point of view. So this. Microservices does not talk about language, it does not talk about any technology. It is it is just talking about that you have a big application and if you have a big application, many problems come with it and it, because it becomes very difficult to maintain and if you have to do a release of one particular thing, you will have to do a release of the entire big chunk of application which could be like millions of lines. But when you break it down into modular pieces that you have smaller smaller applications which can work individually it becomes much more easier to maintain to test to scale and to uh, even supply more requests so uh, because just like i was telling today there is a demand for score you need not uh, increase the configurations for the other parts of the application just to just for that, but if you have an, a single application, a single monolith, that's not possible. That that's what microservice talks about, and multi-threading and all. That's all part of how you develop your uh, application. So if you're using a node application, then uh, though there are worker threads and stuff, but it's a single-threaded application with a non-blocking I/O. Yeah, great. Then, then you can you may, you say that that if these are all separate sandboxes. That your all microservices will work on separate sandbox or on the same sandbox, like in JVM. Is separate JVMs or something? It's a, no, again a way of question. Yeah. Each microservice has a separate runtime for itself. So okay. if it's it's a Java, it will run on different JVMs. Okay, okay. The, the different sandbox and different Excel. Okay, I got it. But who will couple it together? That you you'll answer it later on. Okay. Yeah, that, that we can uh, okay. look at okay. it later. Thank you. Now, before I go to microservices and stuff, uh, let's talk about little bit about scaling. Like, what is scaling, and uh, why is it very important for microservices? Okay, so uh, can anybody tell me like what is scaling? If anybody is aware. Uh, so like, scaling uh, means uh, just uh, increasing the uh, load balancing thing. Uh, like if I have a great load, a huge load on my uh, current server, so I can uh, scale it, I can uh, add an, another server or I can uh, break it into different parts and uh, make it available in another nodes. This is known as scaling. Yeah, okay, you, you answered it. So in general, scaling are of two types, so horizontal and vertical, right? And uh, Vertical scaling is like you, you have a uh, system where maybe the current system is having four, uh, five cores of CPU with 32 GBs, gigs of memory and uh, as and when you get more load on your system, you increase it to maybe uh, 20 cores of CPU and 256 GB of memory, it's all available in cloud, you can uh, easily get these numbers. So this is what vertical scaling is about and if you are talking about horizontal scaling, Basically, just uh, what you told the budget. So uh, you have one service. Basically, what you create is you create replicas out of the service. So instead of having uh, one instance of the service running, you will have three instances of the service running or four instances of the service running. It can even happen like thousands instances of a service running. And uh, how does uh, it happen that when it goes to one of the uh, replicas? So you'll have to put a load balancer on top of it, so so that uh, the load is equally distributed among the replicas. Ritik, is it not like MapReduce algorithm of, the, of Google? It, it, what you say, the last one, the horizontal one, it is same kind of uh, divide and conquer policy of MapReduce. This is one question, yes. And another is, what about the GPU and TPU part 
Okay, later on you can, at your time you can answer. Yeah, so uh, TPU and TPU, you can add additional parameters to this. So, I, I just spoke of the uh, okay. ports and memory, you can add those things also. Okay, okay, great. It, it all depends upon what kind of application you are building. Okay. Okay, okay and the map reduce, I don't think it's anywhere relatable here because uh, I'm not much aware of map reduce algorithm and stuff, but uh, uh, like whatever I know of is that if you have a large data set and you have to compute something from there, you do some map reduce. I'm yeah, yeah, I can tell map reduce is nothing but you 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 open up a book, a very thick book, you tear apart with hundred pages, give it to separate problems, and they all uh, combine the result to a common uh, uh, common sheet and again divide. So, it is a repeated divide and conquer, it is, is a kind of uh, map reduce, but the problem should be alike for this map reduce. Not all problems can go to map reduce, like Google uh, searching and all this can be map reduce. Okay, it is a, okay. you carry on in, your own work. Okay. Yeah, in, in load balancer, there are various algorithms. So, yeah. there are things like round robin and things, so based on some uh, deciding parameter. So, it will basically balance the load between all the replicas. Uh, whenever request comes. Okay, great. Yeah, so, it's just a brief thing like to just understand when I talk about uh, scaling separately and all what I'm talking about. And in general, whenever we are talking about scaling in microservices, we are always talking about horizontal scaling because uh, this does not, uh, because you can't just keep on increasing it. You have to go for undistributed computing. Okay, okay. Right? Okay, carry on. Okay, now uh, let me come to one thing, uh, messaging. So now I told that uh, you previously you had one single application which is called a monolith. Now in this monolith, uh, everything was in bound of the same application. That is why you could easily communicate. You have one class of maybe if you're writing in Java, you have one class and you have its methods. And if you have to communicate between you just do a method and basically you transfer information between one sub part to the other sub part and things like this. But now that uh, you have divided uh, your application, it becomes very important like how do you uh, communicate between the microservices because uh, there, there will be uh, cases where uh, one microservice won't be acting alone. The result, what will happen? will come between the collaborative work between uh, one or more microservices. Okay. So, the main thing what I am trying to tell here is uh, microservices need to communicate. And uh, so, uh, what are the various ways that a microservice can communicate? One is synchronous messaging. So, synchronous messaging is generally uh, achieved with REST APIs. So, I think if uh, you guys have worked with the web applications, you would be aware of REST APIs. So, even if you're not aware of the REST standards and stuff, it's basically just HTTP APIs. And uh, you uh, have a response body, you get a response. So, if uh, I have to get something from another microservice, I do a get call. If I have to do some creational operation, I just do a post call to one of the other microservices. And this is how we can transfer messages. Another way of uh, messaging is asynchronous messaging. So, what is the difference? Basically, in synchronous messaging, when you fire and request, you get the response at that point of time, right? So, but if, if you are uh, hitting one URL, you get the response at that point of time. Okay, you don't have to wait for the response. Uh, like, you fire it, you get something, and then again, you have to do something to get the response. You don't do that way. Right. This is the synchronous way of uh, messaging. The other way, asynchronous way of messaging is where you send a message, but you don't get the response at that point of time. Okay. So, what happens is uh, only the message is sent, but there is no response with that. Again, the uh, wh whoever received the message, that party can do its set of work and again send an asynchronous message back to whoever had sent, if it needs an acknowledgement. Ok, 
okay so uh, i don't know if it is getting complicated or something but uh, ask me if there is any questions on this yeah understood uh, great yeah rithik i just want to say if you, for a for a simple model like you have uh, chosen i remember whenever you were chosen in 2017 project not django you, you chosen the simpler model of python flask the same way can you suggest uh, uh, if you take it up the which one should be open source free and easy to implement like uh, for my message bus because message bus is very popular for the last 20 years uh, it, it may be different protocols not these protocols like soap is one area pro protocol then uh, the tipco one is a famous product in on message bus and wave sockets is a really well known so uh, you just uh, tell out which one to try the student should try in their projects in the second first year second year third year projects not first year second year third year projects thank you you take your okay, time so if, if you're talking about python and message bus so it's not related to either flask or uh, django uh, you will get uh, suppose if you are using kafka you will get kafka connect uh, py kafka connect uh, for python even if you are using active mq then uh, there are various uh, i don't want to get into details because then it will get complicated okay. but uh, i'll also ex explain what a message bus is because otherwise uh, it's just some words um, yeah so like if, I, if i'm talking about kafka then uh, there are libraries in python like py kafka connect you can use with that okay, and uh, so message bus is generally used between inter microservice communication whenever you want to uh, some asynchronous messaging okay. and uh, web sockets uh, i think if you somebody you could have used this already i don't know uh, so uh, if you want to like if you have an ui on the uh, browser you have some angular ui or some react ui or even jquery or something and um, if you want you, you want to do some asynch like if you want to do a chatbot or something and uh, you want uh, like somebody uh, like if there are two persons chatting in suppose and one person uh, presses enter with some message and uh, it should automatically go to that one if you don't use wave sockets what you have to do from the ui you have to continuously pull and see if a message has come if a message has come, if a message has come. but that's not very effective because you are hitting the server too many times uh, first of all it is network intensive because you are uh, making too many requests and uh, also it, it is degrading the performance both on the client side and on the uh, server side. So WebSocket, what you can do it, you, you can uh, initiate a transaction from the server side itself. So you can, uh, so the client basically connects to the server once and then whenever there is a message on the line, uh, they can uh, put it to the uh, client device. Uh, then you want to mention, uh, then you want to say the message bus Kafka is better uh, as asynchronous and web socket is, I, am, I, am I understood correctly? And no, no, there is nothing like this is better and that is bad. Okay. Uh, these are for completely different purposes. So web sockets are generally used between just like I told between the UI layer and the public facing services. So uh, whenever you have an UI for your application and you want to do some asynchronous kind of messaging, well, or just the scenario that I told that two persons are chatting like whatever happens in Facebook. So whenever you open the chat window, so uh, at that point uh, the UI will connect to the server using a web socket and uh, whenever there is a message sent to him, it will automatically be notified from the server end to the client end. If web okay. sockets were not there, then you have to continuously make uh, REST API calls and uh, see if there is a message available, if there is a message available, which is not quite effective. Okay. Great. Yeah. And message bus, it is there when uh, uh, you have to communicate between one microservice to the other. I'll okay. come, uh, uh, what is a message bus? I I don't know if it's getting complicated. Uh, no, no, it's okay. It's understandable. Absolutely. Okay. Now, this is a message bus, basically. So, in if you are making a HTTP call on the URL, uh, you have an URL. So uniform resource locator, which you basically fire and uh, you get a, you uh, pass in some HTTP parameters with that, maybe query parameters, header parameters or request body and you get some response body along with that. In a message bus, what happens is 
it is a publisher subscriber model okay where basically there will be multiple publishers and multiple subscribers okay and this uniform resource locator url is analogous to a topic in a message bus okay so a subscriber can be subscribed to a particular topic clear right so a subscriber can subscribe to a particular topic in a message bus and whenever any publisher puts some message into this topic it will automatically go to the subscriber okay is, is it clear okay okay so this is how this a uh, publisher subscriber model works so uh, here it's not that subscriber is uh, uh, calling one URL and only then it is getting one message. So a publisher puts a message and the subscriber gets it. This is how it works. Okay, and and uh, there are basically two ways in which a message bus can work. Okay, one is called anycast, another is called multicast. Okay, anycast is like if there are multiple subscribers subscribing to a particular topic. Okay only one of the subscriber will get the message from the publisher okay. and multicast is like all the subscribers will get the message okay. okay it's okay even if you don't understand the anycast and multicast i just want you to understand that uh, there's a message bus so through which you can communicate at this point that is fine and uh, there's something called topic to which you can send a message and uh, the subscriber can subscribe to one topic and it can receive a message. This is how in general a message bus works. And you will have different names for different kind of message bus. Like for example, in ActiveMQ they call it as a queue, and in Redis queue even it calls as a queue. In Kafka it's called it as a topic. So it uh, varies from thing to thing. Uh, hi Ritek, uh, this is Tanuj speaking. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm not from uh, BPP IMD. Uh, I saw this link. Yeah, answer, let me uh, interrupt. Let me interrupt. Uh, uh, Tonuja is. Uh, I must welcome uh, Tonuja. He is. I'm introducing Tonuja on his behalf. He is. Uh, uh, he is Roshni uh, Tamishra Tanya's friend. Uh, he is from IIT Kharagpur Computer Science, and then he is doing PhD at Princeton. So we are. Good. It is great that Tonuja has come, and also I welcome Tanya Boni. Uh, you have, uh, 2018. Tanya, welcome. Tanu, welcome, uh, Tanuja. Uh, please ask the question. Sorry for interruption. Tanuja, please. No, no worries. Thank you. Thank you for the great interruption, uh, Professor. Uh, so I speak because this looks really interesting. With uh, I was just wondering that um, since uh, like you have this message bus, and uh, what kind of uh, security procedures do you have for um, multicast? message bus because someone can actually eavesdrop on the message bus for example a CAN bus that is used in autonomous vehicles I was just wondering do you, do you know about any of the security measures that are implemented on a, a message bus which is not you know not broadcast or it's any cast or multicast or single cast something like that do you have any like uh, views on that okay so uh... CAN is like it's a different thing like it's used in automotive this one but uh, coming to this kind of message buses so uh, generally for this thing what happens is you have mutual TLS certificates so uh, basically for a topic uh, in Kafka and all you, you can actually uh, put certificates so uh, the very, if you are not having the valid certificates you won't be able to connect to a particular topic. Perfect. So, yeah. Sounds great. And what about a multicast? So let's say that A, B, D, and E can actually, uh, it's, it's like a WhatsApp group call, right? So does that mean that A, B, D, and E share the same TLS certificates? Yeah, yeah. They, they so, share the same TLS certificates because if you have to be connected to that particular topic, you need to have all that uh, mutual TLS uh, ah, credentials. Okay, so every topic has its own TLS certificate. Makes yeah, you can configure it that way or you can also configure it uh, at a bus level. So, uh, that it's an entire bus level. It all depends Sounds on how you configure. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so any more questions on this? No, no. Carry on. Uh, just I want to say I recently uh, see a security magazine. What Tanuja is saying now, uh, one uh, security expert is saying that nowadays uh, end-to-end -end security that is always 
that is has to be ensured uh, not within this. So, end to end point at the end point uh, they must be secured. Uh, am I getting the sense? Uh, okay, carry on. Uh, I think it will be clear. Are you talking about on the where encryption or something? Encryption, so it is like end to end point. Not in between, there may be encryption, but that can be broken. But end to end, uh, there should be some not one time like password type, maybe like, yeah, but that is a different ball game altogether. You carry on. I think uh, it will be clearer more later. Okay. Thank uh, maybe you. I can just tell in general how it happens. So, uh, yeah. Uh, to connect one topic, you will have uh, some certificates and uh, yeah. Kafka, if you are using Kafka or something, uh, Kafka will take care of, uh, first of all, uh, when you are transferring the data, it will be uh, encrypted with the um, certificates. And again, uh, uh, there is something like if you are using Kafka, there is something called as a Kafka serializer and Kafka deserializer. So, uh, you can actually change the implementation so that you also uh, put some custom security on the go. Like that's how we do it in our company actually. So uh, we have uh, serializers which are built by the security organization of a company, and they have to use that so that uh, and it has to all it has to follow all the company standards of the uh, security measures that have to, they have to, that have to be taken and. Uh, because in Kafka, it's there's one another thing called Zookeeper actually, uh, which uh, stores some things, and you cannot uh, store sensitive data without encrypting it. So it's also the data is also encrypted, and it's also encrypted on the go. Great. Okay. Carry on. Carry on. Okay. And uh, now uh, coming to one more word uh, that is containerization. Okay, so uh, here uh, the budget that thing comes called uh, your Docker containers, your Kubernetes, and stuff. Yes. So uh, uh, this is again a very basic picture. I, I just put in some things so that I could explain so that it will easier for me in the later parts. So uh, a container basically it is kind of an lightweight virtual machine. If I say it in easy terms. So it will have a shared OS kernel, and which will like if you're running it on a uh, Linux system, it will use the uh, system Linux kernel. And on top of that, there will be the runtime dependencies. Like for example, if you're running a Node application, you will have the Node dependencies in it. If you're running a Java application, you will have the Java runtime environment, something like that. And on top of that, uh, there will be the application process. Okay, so. Uh, uh, if you are using a Spring Boot application or something, you will have the Spring Boot jar which will be running in it. If you are having a uh, Node application, you will have your, uh, it will be started with Node and you will have your Node source code, code in it. In there. And if you are like similarly for Python. Okay. And uh, each container uh, can be mapped to a port in the host port. For example, if your uh, application is running on port 8080 uh, in, in the Docker container, okay, so it has to be mapped to a port on the host so that it can be accessed from the host machine. Okay. So this is called a port mapping. So from a container, you can map an in-container port to a host port in the system. And also, uh, there might be requirement that you need to access files from the host system. In, in an container. So there's something called as volume mapping uh, through which you can uh, map a particular uh, uh, the, a host file system to inside a container. And using this volume mapping, you can also do actually network file share where you can have network drives and uh, you can mount it inside the container. And this container is actually in general uh, basic for any microservices deployment and this is a uh, go to way of how uh, microservices are deployed uh, on cloud using docker containers because it it's really makes it easy for, for deployment because uh, everything is bundled in together and it uh, takes care of a lot of other worries yeah rithik i have one question like in a basic uh, cloud computing the first uh, three stages one is infrastructure as a service and second was platform as a service 
and third one is software as a service. I think you are talking of infrastructure as a service. Am I correct? Or a platform as a service or both? Okay, so uh, I have not spoken about anything uh, cloud here uh, as well because uh, I am just talking about a Docker container. So, uh, what is a Docker container? So, if you are talking about in general infrastructure as a service, so you only get the bare metal infrastructure. So, you just get the system, you get the OS installed in it and you will have to configure everything else. Like Amazon EC2 I think, Elastic Cloud. Yeah, it, it's Amazon EC2 uh, okay. and you have to also get with some other more components uh, to make it an entire infrastructure. Okay. For uh, platform as a service if you are talking then uh, you get something like you are creating a uh, spring boot uh, web engine you are creating a uh, python web engine uh, things like that so there you don't uh, take care of the runtime uh, you get an entire runtime you just tell that okay this is my uh, executable you just run can it you take it, it google Cloud, google uh, collab can you take take it as a platform as a service uh, Google Colab is an example uh, of platform I, as a service. I haven't used Google Colab, but okay. uh, I, I think if you're talking about uh, GCP, then uh, what is that? Uh, okay, there's some Google Compute Engine, I guess that is uh, okay. infrastructure as a service, and there's one that is I a platform as a service. That yeah. is a platform. I think it is a platform as a service. Google Colab. Compute Compute Engine is, uh, I think, infrastructure as a service. That's one more I is a competitor of Amazon EC2, I think. There must be some Google counterpart, uh, definitely. Amazon and Google, definitely. okay, carry on. Okay. So, like I told, in this one is a basic unit uh, where an uh, microservice is deployed on the cloud. Okay. Now, on cloud, you won't have a single machine. You won't have a single virtual machine on uh, running on the server. Um, like on your entire infrastructure, you will have multiple machines. That is how. That is why I was talking about scaling and how uh, you you have to scale your application so that uh, you can take in more requests. You, you can have more load on it, right? So uh, basically, on the uh, um, any uh, infrastructure, what we will have is. Uh, I have shown the logo of Kubernetes here, so uh, it could be Kubernetes, it could be Docker Swarm, uh, it could be uh, Amazon also has its own thing, I just forgot the name, or whatever be it. So uh, container orchestration means uh, you have multiple containers running on multiple virtual machines, okay. And now all these uh, containers that are running needs to be orchestrated, right. So uh, like there is microservice 1 running in the first virtual machine in the first container. There is microservice 2 running on uh, the second uh, container of the second virtual machine. Now, how if microservice 1 has to communicate to microservice 2, how will microservice 1 know like how do you, uh, like if it has to communicate to rest, how will it know that how, how uh, it will communicate. So, uh, Container orchestration makes all these things easy, okay. And uh, there are other things like if uh, a server goes down, if like a micro one instance of the microservice one goes down due to some issue, the container orchestration will automatically bring one more instance up. So these are the things that uh, the container orchestrator does. So in general, you'll have a manager node, okay, which will manage the entire uh, cluster. And then you will have worker nodes basically, and these worker nodes will actually have the application containers running. And there will be an orchestration network which will actually be uh, done by the manager, and uh, all the containers can communicate through this orchestration network. And in general, uh, there could be multiple managers also uh, in a cluster, and in general, a manager will have a reverse proxy. Uh, reverse proxy is something like if you have something like uh, mail.google.com okay uh, so it will translate this mail dot to an actual uh, container like uh, there will be a gym there will be gmail services running so it will know like okay when you tell mail dot something which service it actually should be 
Okay. okay. So, this is like in basic, uh, there are many complications to it, but uh, this like in basic, this is how uh, any platform will look like in a microservice architecture. But in technically, there should be another backup manager must be. There is one manager maybe died, another manager can be taken up. I think there should be at uh, least another one. Yeah, in, in general, uh, there is never one manager. There will be multiple managers based on the size of the infra infrastructure. Okay. okay so, uh, the, it is actually recommended to keep the managers in odd numbers because uh, these orchestrators, they, uh, they do a voting. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. exactly. So they do a voting to become a primary manager. Mm -hmm. So that is why it's recommended that you always have uh, managers in the uh, count of, on count of odds. Yeah. Okay. So Rithik, I was also wondering this. So like uh, in a similar fashion that uh, every virtual machine needs a virtual machine ma manager, uh, do you need another manager to manage all the managers since you have multiple managers? And uh, what hierarchy does this go up to? No, no, you, you don't need uh, another manager to uh, manage the managers. So there is a primary manager. Uh, if you have three managers, you will have one manager called as a primary manager. Okay. And, and you uh, have. Yeah, yeah, continue, please. No, no, I, please go on. Please go on. Yeah. And uh, you have these multiple managers only because uh, you have to scale. Now, uh, all the requests that comes in actually it comes through these managers okay if you have a single manager this will get overburdened so right. what hap okay. happens actually you have multiple managers and uh, now you have multiple reverse proxies also so it so you will have to put a load balancer on top of it right so now you have to have this uh, uh, consensus algorithm uh, and uh, what would you say distributed systems uh, like all the manager should be on the same page or like should have the same copies of the virtual states and the statuses right so how is this done like uh, do the virtual machine so do the managers communicate within themselves also yeah they communicate among themselves so uh, uh, all this is abstracted so uh, kubernetes it's it's an production grid orchestrator and it controls everything Okay, I, I can't go deep into Kubernetes and tell you how it works. But right. I'm not uh, very knowledgeable into that, but uh, it's taken care by the orchestrator. That's how it works. Great. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I was thinking about the orchestrator itself. Yes. Uh, so, like the orchestrator kind of manages the managers, right? Yeah. So, uh, like this entire thing is called as an orchestration, and uh, Kubernetes is the orchestrator, which ha which requires manager. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, previous one what I showed was kind of like a physical architecture of uh, how you have virtual machines, you have containers and all those stuff. And uh, this one is actually how uh, microservice logical architecture looks like. So, in general, uh, you will have something like an UTZ means untrusted zone. So, this is where uh, your application users will be there and uh, they'll always have an API gateway through which they'll have to uh, communicate. Okay. And there's a militarized zone, okay. uh, which uh, upon authorization, the users from the untrusted zone can access these microservices. And uh, there are microservices in the trusted zone, which uh, these uh, users can cannot directly access. They actually always they are always accessed through these microservices. Okay. And uh, in general, a total thing will always have an identity provider, which will uh, do your authentication basically. So you provide your username, password, and they'll give you an authentication JWT token, which says that, okay, your identity is valid. Then there will be an external authorization server for the external users. Okay, so um, if an user is, actually authorized to use a particular microservice. That's what the authorization server takes care of. And uh, uh, always for a particular product, there will be a set of microservices. So there will be a microservice, some micro set of microservices in the militarized zone, which will be accessed by the uh, public users. And there will be some in the trusted zone. In trusted zone, generally all communications happen over to mutual TLS so that uh, it's 
but nobody else from inside also who are not authorized to access can actually access it. And uh, these set of microservices, these are suppose built by a separate team and you need some external authorization to again access these microservices. So, uh, again you will have something like an internal gateway uh, uh, through which you need to use the uh, internal authorization server so that you can access these mic site of microservices. And always uh, there will be some infrastructure layer uh, which will have the instances of your databases, your monitoring tools, your message buses and stuff and uh, also your logging infrastructure. So, the, this like the top level view of in general how and uh, cluster looks like. Any question? No, no, Rithik, excellent, but Rithik, it is 30 years back, IBM has IBM famous uh, this, uh, this uh, services, uh, Tix uh, there, Tix is very famous in this and then came the MSMQ by the micro Microsoft. I think uh, they are in similar line, but they are major services, maybe they are right now in the microservices. I, I remember IBM Kicks is very famous for, for the service management in around 30 years back, I am telling you. Right now also Kicks is there, Kicks is still there, yeah. Actually, the microservices architecture is nothing new, it is it's there from uh, uh, quite old age, uh, yeah. but it's, it has gained a lot of popularity nowadays. Yes, 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 yes. Due to yeah. this distributed computing mm. requirement. Yeah. yeah. Carry on. Yeah. Now, uh, I, I won't go much into details, but uh, in microservices, there are some patterns like in general uh, how you divide uh, and say a single application into multiple things. Uh, so, I will just talk about two, three patterns of uh, how generally it is built, okay. So, like sub, this is one pattern, this is called the aggregator pattern. So, in this pattern what will happen is, uh, there will be an aggregator microservice, okay. And uh, there will be multiple microservices and uh, this aggregator microservice what it does is, uh, it will get bits and pieces of response from these uh, sub microservices and it will aggregate the output and it will respond. Okay, so, this is a very simple thing, uh, but this is uh, very quite popularly used. So, uh, a particular task is divided into, uh, it is not exactly dividing into tasks, but uh, separate things itself. So, you get uh, responses from all the three microservices and you aggregate it and uh, combine it into something and then return it to the user. Uh, so, uh, while dividing this is how you think of, that is what I am meaning to say. So, uh, moving forward, uh, this is one more pattern that is called a chain of responsibility. Like I, I was talking about message bus and asynchronous uh, messaging. So, this is how it works here. Okay. So, there will be a entry point to a microservice where uh, basically there will be an async submit. So, if it is using an REST API, so uh, they will say that maybe uh, for example, uh, if you are talking about suppose, if you have to run a simulation of a car suppose. Okay. So, you say that okay simulate, right and uh, simulation is not a short span of uh, job that can be uh, done on the click of an URL. Right. So, what will happen is uh, it will return a transaction ID for you at that point of time okay. and you will have to keep track of this transaction because no response is sent at that point of time. What happens? It is a chain of responsibility. So, uh, yeah, in this entry point what happens? Uh, it will do some operation then again tell okay, I am done with my uh, job, microservice 1 you take care of the next part. Microservice 1 does some part and then again tells microservice 2, okay, you do the next part. Again, uh, 2 does the same thing and it again sends to the next microservice. So, it happens in a chain. So, it is called chain of responsibility pattern. 
and uh, again maybe it's not compulsory that it will send an acknowledgement back if required on completion of the entire task it will send to the entry point or the maybe the orchestrator of this entire chain and uh, it will save the state that okay uh, this is in this state it can also send responses at every level okay that okay this has finished up till this state this this job has been finished till this state something like that and the user can either poll or again maybe they can be connected to a web socket or they can be connected to a message bus to which the event will be sent uh, was this pattern clear yes okay. I'll, I'll have one a small very small case study so uh, there have at least used this small pattern and I'll show it there so this is one more pattern so uh, this is coming with an application resiliency so uh, this is the circuit breaker pattern okay. uh, what this pattern is about let's suppose uh, your application server is receiving too many requests at uh, some point of time and due to some issue some load or some error in the application server the application server is not able to handle so many requests okay. so uh, what the general saying goes into this kind of scenario is that the worst thing that you can do to an uh, server when it is actually not able to respond is you send more requests to it right so the best thing when a server is not able to respond as necessary is that you stop sending requests to it you give it some time so that it it can self heal itself okay if there is too much of load and if you give it some time uh, it will automatically come back into normal performance after some point of time not necessarily that it will come back but uh, uh, it's very much probable that it will come back to its normal okay. so this circuit breaker pattern uh, what it does is basically it has various parameters like uh, for a particular sliding window if these many requests fail uh, for a particular uh, server then it will basically open up the server, uh, circuit so that the requests do not go to the actual application server instead it is redirected to an fallback so the response is sent from a fallback this fallback can have various strategies to send a response it could be some default response or it could be something like it is a replica of the application server it uh, at a regular interval it calls and it gets the state from the application server and keeps it in it so it can cache it um, it could be many things like that now once the circuit is open it will have some time duration like okay the circuit has to be open for some period of time after the circuit is open for some period of time the circuit breaker will automatically switch the state for, of a circuit breaker to half open at this half open state what happens is some um, requests are sent to the fallback some requests are sent to the application server and it sees that is the application server able to take requests if it is able to take request then again it goes back to the closed state otherwise it stays again goes back to the open state and waits for that again uh, open period of time okay. so it is done so that our system is resilient enough uh, it, it just improves the resiliency because in all uh, applications you might uh, get too much of load and maybe it has not been scaled to the proper amount or maybe there is some problem in the application server because of which it is not actually able to take whatever it can take at that point the best thing is that uh, you don't send request to the server that is the best way to handle at that point was this pattern clear are there any questions yes yes uh, uh, it is like the circuit breaker is uh, some kind of firewall with some extra facility right it's not a firewall uh, firewall is a different thing this is just like it will either allow the uh, incoming request to pass through or it will send to the fallback okay, okay. yeah uh, i think the instead of firewall it may be uh, related to intrusion detection system it could be intelligent one intelligent uh, circuit breaker i think it is 
more like not a firewall but intrusion detection system maybe intelligent circuit breaker am i correct rithik uh, this one it doesn't uh, deal with intrusion and anything it, yeah, it, it has a very simple responsibility that is if the application server is not able to take in request cut off request from the application server okay That's logic is logic is much simpler yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. this is what it does because uh, this simple thing improves the resiliency to one to one next level Okay. And uh, and there there are various topologies also like there are some things like active active and active passive. So a circuit breaker is also used in things like an active passive. So what is active passive? Let me tell. So there are two application servers, and uh, now uh, only one application server is actually active all the time, and the it goes to the uh, second server only when. Uh, the application server one is not able to take requests. Okay, so a circuit breaker is used even in that active passive configurations. Active active is like when you have two application servers and you put a load balancer on top of it. That's an active active configuration. Okay, great. Carry on. Take your time. You have a dinner. Uh, I, I we have taken dinner. We, I am enjoying it. I think all others are enjoying it. Uh, welcome Tamisha, welcome Tanya, welcome Tonujoy, welcome Praveen, all, all are great. Uh, uh, after some time we have a little chat, uh, not all the time, uh, so we can make our uh, video on. Uh, so, uh, Ritik, you please take your time, no issue. Carry on. Okay, okay. Yeah, I am almost in till the end because I won't go into much detail, it will get complicated. Yeah, I think the because uh, Tamisha and Tanya will work with you, that is the reason I am I am mentioning, specially mentioning, nobody should mind anything else. And I also, uh, Praveen is also there. He is very instrumental of our student project. And also Devaditya Dotto, he has helped a lot in our wearable uh, recognition. Thank you, Mr. Devaditya Dotto also. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Now, logging. Now, this is a big problem when you have such a distributed system. So, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware. But logging is a very important thing uh, in developing any application. So uh, you have to have precise logs to identify any error. So if there is any uh, uh, problem in a system, the only you, you won't be able to go back to the time and see what happened. The only thing you will have left are the logs that are left by the application. Okay. So yeah, I must. Have, yeah, I must add, uh, Ritik. This is my old knowledge. The logging should be a distributed on another machine, not on the same machine. It should be distributed. Am I correct? Because it is yeah, the uh, yeah. yeah. That's what I will come to. Yeah. So now uh, what happens is uh, if you are writing the logs to a file, so uh, an application will keep generating these logs of uh, like what is happening inside the application. It can be normal steps of what is happening, and it could be the error scenarios, everything. Will be logged in this log files. Now you have such a distributed system and you actually don't know and uh, these containers are coming up going down because uh, it's dynamic uh, in this actually the scaling is not a fixed scaling kind of thing. It can also scale based on demand. If there is more demand uh, the number of containers will go up. Okay, So uh, there's such it's such a dynamic system and you just have this uh, log file ins lying inside these containers. So what do you do with this? You can't go inside uh, each machine, check the logs when there is an error. And you might not even have that container. You might not even have that file when uh, you actually want the error. Yeah, Rithik, this container is a kind of enterprise Java means sort of things? Or it can be a JVM or it be Python virtual This is machine. a Docker container. It's, it's a, Docker. a generic container. It's a generic okay, so, container. Okay. Yeah, so uh, if I go back, uh, this is the container that I'm talking about. Any 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 practical example? The Docker you say. Uh, any any realize this is a you are saying is a generic point, but what is the practical uh, implementation of it? Uh, any okay, example? So if, if I make it very simple, you have one server yeah. and uh, you, you have to uh, deploy something on the on the cloud maybe and uh, maybe you are running and uh, Java server. Okay. 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 So in the container, you will deploy your Java application. That's what it is. Yeah, earlier it was uh, five six years back. It was done by 
uh, enterprise Java beans, the session beans, and entity beans. Uh, is there same way related with this, or is it different way ball game together? I think whenever we learn the enterprise Java beans, there's some entity beans, session beans. I think it is related with session beans. Some I can. Uh, I think some related with some some uh, similarity. Well, that is beans. a complete. That's a complete different thing. That okay. that is again going to the implementation okay. point of view. Okay. Understood. Okay. Carry on. So now, so container you can consider something like a virtual machine. That's what it is. Okay, with great. Okay, and you have the application running within that. Okay, but it's not exactly a virtual machine, but it's kind of like a lightweight virtual machine. Okay. Uh, just uh, one question, please. There's a virtual machine. There is a steep competition between Oracle and the VMware. Is there any other or Google is also there? I uh, VMware also giving competition. I think. Is the VMware is related with this implementation of virtual machines? VMware uh, so company nets. So uh, this one is from Docker, and okay. it's not exactly a virtual machine. It's okay. uh, to make it simpler. I'm just telling that it's kind of like a virtual machine because okay. it separated out. It's not exactly like a virtual machine. Virtual, virtual machine, machine is more elaborate, I think. Virtual machine is more elaborate yeah, than Docker. Yeah, it, it's more more elaborate. Uh, it's uh, much more. It is just a lightweight thing, a okay. container. Okay, okay, great. So, this actually just provides a runtime to an application, okay. so that you don't have to install it on the bare metal infrastructure. Okay, great. Okay. okay. So now, so you have. Uh, all these applications running in a distributed environment, and you have all these log files. Now, what do you do with this? And this, these are very important. Okay. So, what we have to basically do is we need to have something which can collect these logs and put it somewhere centralized. Right. So, that's the uh, uh, common way that we should do it. So, uh, in general, in industry, we have uh, this uh, framework called ELK, uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Okay, so uh, this dotted thing that I have, this is one virtual machine, and again, there is another virtual machine, and inside the virtual machines, there is microservice one running and microservice two running, which are basically Docker containers, and again, microservice three and four is running in another virtual machine, and all these microservices are generating these logs. So, uh, what we generally have is in every virtual machine, there will be, uh, sorry, I uh, didn't write it, but uh, this L logo, whatever is there, this is a log stash. Okay, you can also have another thing called file bit. So, what this log stash does is, it's kind of like an uh, file watcher. So, you can tell that to watch these files. Okay, you can configure a log stash to watch these files. So, whenever there is a change in these files, it will automatically shift this log. So, these are called shipper instances of the log stash. Okay. It will shift this logs uh, one line at a time and uh, this uh, icon what you see is Kafka. So, uh, uh, through Kafka, it will shift this logs and there is another log stash instance. This is the indexer log stash instance. So, these logs will be put into this indexer which will act actually indexes to the Kibana store. And in uh, sorry, uh, this is Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is the place where actually all the logs are stored. So from all these instances, uh, all the log files are actually put into this uh, Elasticsearch store. And uh, Kibana, what you can do is you can visualize these logs. So you can tell that I want logs for this microservice one from this time to this time. So, it will search all these things from um, Elasticsearch and it will show you up in the dashboard. So, this is in general uh, how uh, an enterprise logging uh, framework looks like. Uh, there are various other technologies which are used in some other, but this is in general a standard uh, that is used. It's very commonly known as ELK stack. Any Google is following this, or uh, it is our Facebook or any other platform? Can you give any uh, practical reference to it? Uh, I don't know what uh, Google uses inside. I'm not aware of that. But uh, Google whatever make it they secret. use, Google make it secret. Generally, they do not come out. That is the yeah, problem. But 
even they can use some other technologies but ultimately in all everywhere it happens in a similar fashion at least yeah so, they are proprietary yeah, they will, make it proprietary yes yeah. they'll have shippers where uh, which will take in the logs and ship it to a centralized location and there will be a uh, visualizer which uh, just reads from that uh, store and it will visualize so if i give you some alternative of kibana there's some things like spunk so even there you can visualize okay great okay. and also i have not i don't have another slide for this but uh, uh, there are other you have to also monitor this uh, virtual machines and this container so if uh, the ram the memory usage is going up very high or the cpu usage is suddenly spiking up so and also you have to check in the request so suddenly there is a burst of request from a certain region or so there could be ddos attacks on that so you always have to monitor monitoring is also very important so there are tools like grafana uh, through which you can monitor all this uh, microservices so it, it's basically a visualization tool you will have various graphs and stuff so it will just show you that uh, you, you can write various queries and stuff based on that you will have visualizations and if you see something that is wrong you can take proper actions so kushanu uh, since you mentioned about uh, like monitoring and uh, monitoring for dos and ddos services i just wanted to you know like get your view on uh, like what kind of detection mechanisms do you use do you like use idess and also like uh, you have different containers right and uh, you have to optimize for the performance for example vm1 is not used all the time it's being used like 10% of the time so what kind of optimization techniques or uh, like monitoring techniques exist in the industry at this point of time and uh, what kind of uh, obstacles do you face or do you think that it, this could be better this could be better or it would be better to have this feature so what are your views on that okay so uh, if we're talking about the utilization point then uh, uh, the thing is uh, you have kubernetes and it will take care of distributing the load so uh, like you you uh, uh, it has proper algorithms uh, through which it can distribute the load it won't happen that uh, only this much is used or that much is used only of one container if we're talking about uh, the ddos attacks and stuff so i'm not much experienced in operations so these are generally not take in taken care by uh, software development engineers and uh, there are operations engineers and support engineers who continuously sit and visualize and stuff so i am not much knowledgeable into that so just that i i, I just mentioned in that uh, there are tools for this which you can uh, visualize and uh, you can check so uh, like I, i keep getting mails always that uh, there are high number of hits from uh, this place so there is something wrong like or this particular application is suddenly having a high number of hits from there are detection mechanisms okay. which this operation guys do and i'm right, not right, very yeah. much knowledgeable into that no, no it, it makes sense it makes sense i mean uh, i just wanted to get your view because like you are actually working with these things so you know to get uh, the view of a person who is actually working with these things i just wanted to get your view so it makes perfect sense and i know how much nuisance it is to get all these mails from the hr and the operations team saying that you need to change your password and things like that it makes complete sense uh, and thank you for sharing your views thank you great career okay now coming to uh, another important aspect that is ci cd that is continuous integration and continuous deployment so uh, basically you have your git repository and uh, whenever a developer uh, commits code into the git repository uh, it will be built on an uh, uh, ci platform like jenkins right and what happens there is uh, your code is checked in uh, like your code will be uh, cloned and then it will be built for example if it is a java application you will do an maven clean install and you will build the uh, application and then the unit tests whatever is there or integration tests they'll run and post the test uh, there will be some static code analyzer there for example there are tools like sona so uh, it will check like okay uh, 
this set of code has a more cyclometric complexity. So there are three nested ifs. You should not be writing it that way. Or you have a bad naming convention. Or uh, there are other, there could be other complicated things also just for a, a small thing. So a static code analyzer will run and you will get a report in the in uh, Sonar dashboard. Then there will be a vulnerability scan. For example, uh, every application will have uh, uh, many dependencies that will be using along with that. And those dependencies might have some vulnerabilities and it's not wise enough to have uh, vulnerable dependencies and going into production. So uh, again, you will have vulnerability scan and if some of the dependencies having vulnerabilities you have to fix those again commit those again so that all these checks should pass and once everything is passed it's not very so simple like i'm telling there are many other stages but these are the main steps and then whatever artifact you are building so it will be published to the repository so uh, if it if it is a java application it may be it, the jar will be deployed onto the nexus or if it is a node module maybe the node module will be published to npm and uh, if python it will be in a pipe repository things like that or it could also be that a uh, docker image is built uh, from here and it is pushed to a docker repository okay once uh, this is done it will go to the continuous deployment so it could be a manual trigger or it also could be another job that runs so what happens it is deployed on the dev environment and the developers do test on that and say it's an okay go and then it is deployed on the uh, QA environment, the uh, test environment. Then uh, the test teams will trigger test on that. They'll say okay, if the QA environment is fine and then you can go to production. You will have to do a release. Again, it's not that simple. If you have to uh, go to production, you have to go to many processes. Uh, you have to verify. Then you to do deployments, data center by data center. There are many things like that. It's not so simple like it goes one by one. You have to follow many processes and stuff. But in general, this is how it goes. Uh, you build the code, you publish it, then you deploy it on dev, then it goes to QA environment, tests are done, then it goes to production. Okay, okay great. So just let's just finish it off with a small case study. So uh, yeah, let's try to architecture and feature, uh, feature significant uh, significance product. So uh, if you have a data set and you have some results and you have to uh, tell like which feature is more significant for uh, that coming to that result. So this is nothing related to data science. Uh, so uh, like it's a data science part, but uh, I, 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 I'm not talking anything about data science here. I'm just talking how to architecture this uh, part. So uh, the constraints that we are talking about, we will be creating one multi-tenant uh, application. Uh, that is, uh, it's not a single user that will be using. There will be multiple tenants who can use this application. And uh, let's suppose these tenants, they don't want to uh, make it like, uh, you can run this analysis with another person, another person's data set on the same container. They want to maintain a segregation, like uh, because many of these data are or many are times proprietary, and uh, clients will come up with this uh, things like uh, I want my data to be segregated. I don't want anything else to run where uh, my analysis is happening and things like that. So this is what the tenant wants. And uh, will our application will have some API to fit in, fit in the data sets, and then it will run the analysis, and it will tell okay, uh, these these features have this this percent of significance, some things like this. Okay. Then suppose our application will have a dashboard for COVID nineteen. I, I think someone from here had done something like this. That's why I'm putting this. That uh, which features are like suppose there are multiple features. I think. Someone had done something like uh, human population density, water quality, and things like this. They had some characteristics, and based on data from many places, uh, they were just trying to show that uh, which features are actually more significant uh, for an COVID outbreak. Right. So, uh, 
let's suppose we are trying to build a simple thing like this okay, and uh, we want to architecture this and how we want to divide this into an entire thing so coming now so i'll this is my view of like how it could be divided okay. and one thing maybe i had told previously so one wonderful thing about uh, writing it in microservices is that you need not have a single language uh, for that in entire system you can write one microservice in spring you can write one other microservice in python you can go and write another in go you can write another in node so it doesn't at all matter because these are it has separate run times it has separate everything so you can go up and write and do anything with it so there's there's one wonderful thing about writing in microservices so we told that we'll have a dashboard for our uh, this one so we'll have one container or there will be replicas of course uh, where you will have and maybe an angular app uh, or maybe a react app uh, where you will be hosting uh, it could be maybe an nginx server where you will be actually deploying uh, your angular application then we'll have one centralized orchestrator so uh, this orchestrator will have apis for this angular dashboard to use and also for uh, other uh, parties to submit their data so if they want to submit some data they can do so by using the apis of the data orchestrator okay and uh, there will be an uh, i told that i our tenants do not want uh, to run their analysis with someone else on the same node so i'll have one thing called that as an infrastructure manager uh, for example now if our tenant one has come and told me okay i want to run this analysis so this data orchestrator what it will do is it will request the infra manager to uh, like suppose one instance of an analysis node so this infra manager it will go ahead and it will use this uh, docker apis and it will create one container for me uh, which can do the analysis and i'll write all those things in python because python provides we can also do it in r and uh, yeah so uh, this analysis node will come up and then it will have to talk with the data orchestrator and this data orchestrator will provide all this data and what are the analysis has to be done to the analysis node this analysis do, will do all the analysis and then return the data to the orchestrator and it will go down so only as far as need this analysis node will come up it will do the analysis and again go down so you, you need not have a fixed infrastructure uh, for doing as and when you need you can create the infrastructure do it and then again turn things and everything is automated and then i told that uh, i want to have uh, all those covid 19 things so first of all to to do that i need to have some data acquisition so uh, there are some various places from where uh, i want to acquire data from so i'll have one service where uh, it can scrap data from web pages or things so maybe i'll write that using python and only thing that it is responsible for is acquiring data it doesn't do anything else it's just uh, uh, acquires data from various places and then what it after it gathers this raw data what it does is it will it it gives the data to the data transformer service so the job of the data transformer service is uh, it takes in this raw data convert it into an formatted data and then does an async submit to the data orchestrator data orchestrator again uh, performs analysis like i told before similarly okay, so this is how like an entire thing which you would have either way written it in a single thing place maybe uh, now you divide it so what is the advantage now you are getting first of all uh, like if now there is a too much of requirement for data acquisition like there is there is too much data you need not scale all these things up so you you just scale this uh, data acquisition part um, or along with maybe the data transformer service or maybe now uh, there is not too much of uh, data acquisition required there is always data coming from outside and uh, 
you need not even have instances of this uh, data acquisition service running. You can only have this running. So you modular is the entire thing, so that you are using your resources effectively. That's what it is. And also, this can be developed by separate teams. It's not that a single team has to develop the entire thing. Because if you have a single code base, uh, you will have to communicate between like what you are developing and things. So if, if you're having s different teams doing uh, the development, then uh, you can do it. You, you need to modularize this, otherwise that's not possible. Okay, so if there are any suggestions of like how you could better this also, it's welcome. And I think this is my last slide okay, to close this. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Brasen. So, this is a really nice presentation and uh, really um, well articulated. So, I was just wondering, you know, like you have this async submit going from the data transformer service to the data orchestrator, right? So, mm -hmm. could you just tell a little bit more about how you do this? Uh, does the data transform, trans transformer service send the transform data, entirety of the transform data, like the database to the orchestrator, or it just sends a request and the request is sent to? Um, uh, the analysis okay. node and uh, the data is then sent from the data transformer to the analysis node directly. Okay, so uh, the, I, for, I forgot to mention it here. So uh, this part, this from data acquisition service to data transformer to data orchestrator, this is that uh, chain of responsibility that I was talking about. So data acquisition does one thing, then it puts the next thing to this one and then it goes from this one to this one. Now coming back to your question, it all uh, depends upon how you want to do it. So uh, if it is uh, like very large data and you can't transfer that much data over the message bus, then what you can do basically is uh, you can have a network file share, right? So uh, you acquire all the data, put the raw data into the network file share, and you just mention it that the location of where that uh, raw data is present. Data transformer service works on that and then uh, converts this into an formatted data, puts in again to the network drive and says this to the data orchestrator. Here you go, this is where it is available and please proceed with the next operations. Great, thank you. Please so much on and give a great, great clap to Kritik Gaur, who please everyone. And, and now uh, this whole platform is yours. I request Praveen to speak few words. Uh, Tanuja has spoken good. Tanya, please, you speak few words. I have, uh, all our dinners are late. Thank you very much. Uh, Tanya, please. Uh, Praveen, please, and anyone. Devanjuti, also great. You have asked good question. Orunabo, thank you for your support. Thank you, Ritik. Uh, let's wait for few one or two questions or comments for Tafik. Praveen, uh, please speak few words. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, great presentation by Ritik Bhaiya here. And I enjoyed the session and I have to learn. Uh, I also got to learn a few things here. So it was awesome. Thank you. And I'm looking forward for more uh, presentation from Ritik Bhaiya. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll request yeah. Tonuja, Praveen, please you come to a lecture at your time, at your own topic. Tonuja, I'll request you. It's great. You are from Princeton and you are from IIT Kharagpur Computer Science. I am proud that you come and join us. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank sure. you. Thank you. I, I'll actually be in uh, Kolkata in uh, December. Okay. Okay. Open and wait. So anytime you find on uh, any Sunday, 9 p.m. is the slot. Okay. Every Sunday yeah. night we will meet. Right. So you, whenever you okay. feel it is your turn, you give a talk. Thank you, Tanuja, again. Okay. Tanya, are, are, you, yeah. are, you, are you listening? Tanya? Yes, yes, yes. Sir. Yeah, yes how sir, Tanya is a great you, you um, came. Uh, Tamisha has to leave. Tamisha came here because he has some batch ah. meet. Uh, so she left. Uh, Tanya, thank you because you are with Ritikda. Ritikda, you yes, helped Thank Ritikda. you, Ritikda. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya, so Ritikda you... helped us a lot in our project, final year project. All, thank all you, Ritikda, for taking, even, us, even, taking even, our time. You know. Yes, yes, yes. I, Grateful. 